Good morning. I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and this is Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com, streaming live educational and civic engagement on the Internet and Oceanic Channel 16. My guest today is Mr. Gary Gill, who's been a leader in environmental and social justice issues in Hawaii for many years. Gary's carrying on his family's legacy in environmental and economic sustainability long before the term was popularized. Gary's father, Tom Gill, who passed away in 2009, is credited with the creation of the state land use law as a member of the Territorial House of Representatives in the late 1950s. That law created the conservation and agriculturally designated land classifications that remain as the legal foundation that protect important lands from development until today. Gary's uncle Tom, or father Tom Gill, I'm sorry, Gary's I believe it was your uncle, uncle Lauren, Lauren Gill. Yes. Your uncle Lauren Gill founded the Hawaii chapter of the Sierra Club, which Gary later served as director of development. For the past four years, Gary served as the environmental deputy of the Department of Health. In this position, he was responsible for a wide range of pollution control, food safety, and environmental protection programs in the islands. He also led the Hawaii Office of Environmental Quality Control for four years and has worked to reduce fossil fuel dependence for the Blue Planet Foundation. He managed Waimea Valley for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and he developed the Kalihi Nature Park, a bicycle recy recycling program for Kokua Kalihi Valley, and helped protect our water quality while working for the Sierra Club. Gary Gill also served eight years in elected office as a member of the Honolulu City Council, including two years as the chairperson. He was born and raised on Oahu and is happily married with two grown children. <laughs> now he's furthering his family legacy by protecting the natural resources of the Waianae lands that they own. Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure. To tell us about your latest endeavor amongst many. Um, we're going to have to focus since there's <laughs> such a pile of previous We can activities. talk about a lot of things. Yeah, <laughs> but I really look forward to you telling us more about the Gil Evalands, mm -hmm. and particularly how they came about. Sure. And then maybe we have some beautiful photos to show. All right. Well, just as, as background, um, anybody who's familiar with Hawaii will be familiar with the Campbell Estate. Uh, James Campbell in the 1800s consolidated much of the land on the west side and south side of uh, Oahu. Uh, but as the estate aged, it could only last legally until a certain number of years past the death of the last grandchild or something. So James, the estate of James Campbell became the James Campbell Real Estate Company. Um, and they were... Around uh, 2007? About in that time frame. And uh, so they were, uh, as a real estate company, divesting themselves of many of the conservation lands or agricultural lands uh, the undevelopable lands, basically, uh, and focusing in on residential and commercial uh, real estate development. So there were 7,000 acres on the Waianae Mountains, uh, everything above Makakilo, uh, up above Kunia, the whole mountainscape, about 7,000 acres of it, was put up for sale. Unbelievable. 4,000 wow. of those acres were managed by the Nature Conservancy under a lease as the Honoluliuli Nature Preserve. But that whole chunk was for sale, and uh, we were lucky enough to be in the position as a family to work with the Trust for Public Lands that had consolidated some public money, federal, state, and uh, county money, uh, and to partner with the uh, Ed Olson family, who's a, and Ed is a large landowner, mostly on the Big Island. He has uh, holdings in Cunia as well, uh, and he's just an agriculturalist. He, he's preserved the uh, macadamia uh, industry uh, on the Big Island. As well as the watersheds for future ag development. Exactly. So he's big into um, conservation and agriculture, and so he was a perfect partner with us, and we put the resources together with the state bought the whole 7,000 acres in order to preserve it, and immediately 4,000 of those acres were dedicated to the state. So now what was the Honoluliuli Nature Preserve, run by the Nature Conservancy, is now owned by the state of Hawaii and uh, is under the jurisdiction of the Department of Land and Natural Resources uh, Division of Forestry and Wildlife. So 
that whole thing went down uh, and so now the agriculture land and the conservation land uh, above Palihua Road, everything including Camp Timberline and the two ranches and the conservation land up the mountain into and about And just for our viewers, above Palihua Road, exactly where is that if you're coming in your car yeah, from well, downtown Honolulu? In your car, you go as high as you can in Makakilo and then that's it. Okay. Uh, so everything <laughs> above that uh, is uh, in agriculture or conservation land, all the way up to 2,700 feet in elevation. Well, let's take a look at that uh, elevated look. We have beautiful photos. So that is uh, the look over the back of Nana Kuli Valley from um, uh, Piliokahi Valley. And uh, so that's actually looking uh, north uh, over the Waianais uh, from the edge of our property. And we have more? Uh, that's the view from the uh, summit ridge of the Waianae Range looking down into Kunia and across Pearl Harbor. Uh, and so that is a shot actually from the state property from the old uh, Nature Conservancy Preserve. But uh, the access to that is, uh, the easiest access is up above Makakilo crossing uh, the land that we're preserving. And that's that's a, a view of Honolulu and Diamond Head across uh, Pearl Harbor, a view that most people don't see. You don't, you don't get that angle very often. But now, can you a, see that one from Camp Timberline? Uh, Timberline is a little bit over the edge of the ridge. So Timberline basically looks south, and this is looking east. So you have to uh, take a little hike up, up above Camp Timberline to get that view. And what are some of the flora and fauna that you're protecting mm. by keeping these in conservation land? Well, you know, the, the irony is that, um, as if you know your Hawaiian history, you will know that um, King Kamehameha accepted a gift from Captain Vancouver of goats and sheep and cows. And he put a kapu on them saying, these are good animals, let them go uh, free, uh, and then uh, they will help you know, support us with meat and milk and things like that. But what uh, the environmentalists at, the, at, at that time didn't realize was that cows and sheep and goats and pigs were not uh, in balance with the native forest. And so they walked through and pretty much wiped out the native forest. Because they had absolutely no predators. Um, well, uh, except for humans. Uh, and. Uh, and, and the kapu prevented humans from um, killing them. And so uh, what was native forest in both the Ko'olaus, if you look up Tantalus behind Manoa, if you look at any of the old pictures from 100 years ago, you see grassland. Mm. Uh, the forest had been basically denuded. Uh, the, the, if the animals didn't eat the plants, they ate the plants under them, and that killed the big trees, or stepping on the roots of, of the large trees. Mm -hmm. uh, so when Campbell purchased the property back in the late 1800s, there were tens of thousands of cows just running wild in the wine eyes, and they had just wiped everything out. Um, so there are a few little pockets that remain of native plants, um, just along the ridges or in little pockets in little valleys where the cows couldn't get down to chew everything up. Um, uh, so when you look at the forest lands now, either looking up uh, you know, behind Honolulu or looking up the Waianais, you'll see a, a big dark green forest, but most of that is exotic timber. It's mm. plants that were put in in the territorial days by the Civilian Conservation Corps. And what they tended to do was bring in eucalyptus, uh, Australian plants, fast growing. Norfolk pines. Norfolks, you'll see lots of Norfolks up there, some sugi pines, some ironwood, you know, mm -hmm. think fast growing things. The, the issue at the time was to try and restore the watershed so that the island's uh, freshwater lens and the water that was used for plantations wouldn't disappear because without the forest, the water wasn't being replenished. Uh, so, so they had that early knowledge of needing to protect the Sure, 100 the years ago, massive amounts of Oahu was reforested, uh, but reforested with exotic woods. And so the forest that you see up there, and you see Camp Timberline, it's kind of ironic because when Camp Timberline was first put in, there were no trees. Right? And, and the timber 
that's up there now, the forest that is behind Camp Timberline, which many sixth graders have enjoyed over the, over the years going up there, um, all of that forest at Timberline is exotic forest. It, it's uh, been planted mostly different species of eucalyptus. Mostly in the 20th century, right? Uh, yeah, the early 1900s up until the 1930s or so. Were any of those trees planted for their actual lumber value? It's uh, it, mostly on the, on the, the Big Island. Uh, there were thoughts in the territory days. Uh, the early foresters were hoping that these fast-growing trees could actually uh, be used as timber in the future. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't really panned out. I think the economies of scale aren't there. Uh, and also, it's very difficult to harvest in those steep mountains right. without a lot of roadways and things like that. But we actually hope to do that. Um, part of our management of the forest is to try and protect the forest from wildfires. Mm -hmm. We had a bad, bad fire about a year ago, started by a couple kids up in Makakilo playing I with matches. Yes. It wiped out hundreds of acres. In fact, uh, it took out the largest remaining stand of native willy willy trees on the island and probably one of the largest remaining in the state. Hundreds of willy willy trees, which are, are very hard to find these days, were just singed and destroyed in that mm -hmm. fire. Um, and, and just for clarification, the willy willy tree's importance in terms of Hawaii's ecosystem, how does it fall? Well, I think uh, every one of the trees, uh, the native trees, is intrinsic to the web of life that existed here uh, historically. Um, unfortunately, you, we can talk about willy willy or the sandalwood uh, or the ohia or the koa. Um, the, there's very few places on Oahu, maybe in the upper reaches of the koolaus, where you can still find a mostly intact native ecosystem well, that supports the native birds and the native insects and the native ferns and uh, the in entire web of life. When we talk about uh, willy willy trees now, you're, you're going to see a few willy willies standing in the back of the valley surrounded by exotic grass. And, and what happens then is the, the grass, for example, guinea grass is so thick that the, the native trees can't come up through it. So you might have a native tree still there, but when it dies naturally, or from disease, or from a storm, or from a fire, it, the babies won't come up because the grass shades them out. So uh, the importance of Willy Willy, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of cultural importance um, you know, in the, the Hawaiian uh, cultural tradition to any number of these plants were used for various things, either medicine or special woods. Uh, for either for spears or canoe building or, or uh, holly. building holly. Um, uh, or they had uh, you know, significant significance in legends and in the stories of, of, of the native people. Um, but uh, you know, in Kalo'i Gulch, which burned, I wasn't aware until we went in after the fire and the grass was cleared out and all the exotic shrubs were killed, uh, you know, burned out and you could see the bare ground and there were the skeletons of hundreds of willy willy trees standing 20, 30 feet tall, mm. which, which I wasn't aware of. Very few people knew they were there. Absolutely devastating. And now they're gone. Yeah. Right. Well, we're going to take a break, Gary, but when we come back, we're going to have some beautiful photos of some of the endangered species, uh, particularly the the snails and spiders and mm. birds. Looking so forward to it. We'll be right back. Thank you. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. 
Hi, welcome back. This is Kirsten Baumgart-Turner with Sustainable Hawaii, and my guest today is Gary Gill. He was about to tell us about the Gill Eva Lands, um, the company that he's created with Ed Olson, and particularly the uh, endangered species there. We've been talking about the trees, but now we're going to talk about the, the birds, and mm. we have some shots of the endangered birds. What are some of them? Well, I've been told by the experts who are actually tending to the endangered species that uh, the southern Waianais um, near our property and Mauka along the ridge in, in state property is uh, one of the few places on the island, if not the only place, that in a single day you can see five native birds. One of uh, which so, is the pueo? Well, on the screen. pueo is the, the native owl, and that uh, uh, lives up along the ridges, uh, hopefully eating as many uh, exotic mice and rats as they can they can And when you say exotic, you mean invasive, <laughs> well, non-native. Well, as we flip through here, the largest uh, enemy to native birds is the rat. Uh, the rats will get up there and eat the eggs or actually eat the parent birds sitting on the nest. And so uh, hopefully uh, we'll have more and more of the native pueo to help keep the, the rat population down. Uh, but it's it's rare to see a pueo on, on Oahu. Obviously, they, they come out in the evening when it's dark, and uh, you have to really work hard to see them. But you, you can find them, and I've uh, found their droppings uh, up in the forest uh, as well. So. And we also you also have the apapane? The apapane, the little red bird. I've seen those up there along the uh, edge of uh, uh, the cliffs uh, at the at the summit ridge. Um, it's uh, a rare on Oahu. Uh, Apapani is more easily found on the Big Island, um, mm -hmm. where, where there's larger forests. And Up so, in volcano, particularly. Yeah, right. So what we're talking on Oahu, again, is just these narrow little strips of native trees that still exist uh, and uh, not an intact forest on the Waianae side at all. So it's quite a treat that the Apapani have managed to survive up there. And their lives balance precariously on the preservation of these native trees. On the trees and the ecosystem in general. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have fires during the fire season all the time, the farther they get up into the mountains, the more they'll destroy the habitat. The other things that are going on with native birds is uh, malaria, avian malaria. Mm -hmm. And so as the temperature increases and the mosquitoes go further up Mauka, uh, the mosquitoes start to inhabit the zone where the birds huh. are currently living, and that can cause disease and the die-off of that native species as well. Not to mention our discomfort. Yeah. Um, one of the birds that I had the pleasure of getting to see is the elepayo. Mm. When David and I came up and yes. hiked in 2012 with the Green Growth exactly. members of the Green Growth Initiative. That was quite a treat. It was a wonderful treat, and what was really interesting was that you were doing uh, preservation with the U.S. Army mm -hmm. Conservation Corps, and we got to see the Army in practice mm -hmm. working with the Elepayo. Yes. Um, this is so the Elepayo? Little Elepayo, right? they're, they're very rare on Oahu. Um, the, because of, uh, this is a little political economy for you, so because of the Endangered Species Act, uh, the U.S. Army, which is having an impact on the range of uh, forest habitat, is required to manage uh, L.A. Pio 75 breeding pairs uh, to make up for the impact of Schofield Range. So one of the places that they do that is up on our property. Uh, we have about 20 breeding pairs of these L.A. Pio. Uh, they're cute little birds, the little tail flaps up. If you see the, the tail popping up and down with a, a little uh, bird like this, then you know that's the L.A. Pio. And uh, they eat insects. Uh, and they are happily uh, living up uh, in relatively easy access. As you know, we can drive up yeah. on a road and see it. In most uh, places on Oahu, you might have to hike for a day or two to get back into the woods to see the L.A. pile. But now, now the Army is having to do this at your property because they have destroyed the habitat where the Army is operating? Is that correct? Well, it's not that they've destroyed it, but uh, under the Endangered Species Act, because of the Schofield Range, where they're out there doing Army maneuvers and explosives and things, um, they, they counted uh, possible impact on 75 breeding pairs of L.A. Pio. So I somewhere see. on the island, they have to go and manage and protect that 75 number. 75 other pairs. Right. right. They actually right. do more than that. But one place they can do it is on our property. Uh, and people like to do it on our property, and we love to have them do it on our property because 
they can drive right up to the forest in their cars and go out and count the birds and, and trap the rats as well, opposed to let hiking. Me, so. Let me counter there. It's not exactly jumping out of your car and you're there. <laughs> There's, there was a beautiful and slightly strenuous hike oh, well, to get yeah, there, just... which was part of the adventure. Mm -hmm. Now, are those trails open to the public? So the trail you're talking about is the Polykea Trail, and that takes off from the top of the road at about almost 3,000 feet in elevation and goes along the ridge of the Waianais up above the Cunia uh, plantation uh, agricultural lots and on the west side you're looking down into Nana Kuli. So that, that uh, is, is a nice walk. It's a, it's a, a public trail. It's on public land, but uh, easiest access uh, is driving up there through our property. So uh, it is controlled access. Uh, we have uh, partnerships with the Sierra Club and Trail and Mountain Club and other groups that come up and hike all the time, and we invite people to come up in a guided and controlled uh, hike environment so that you can learn about it and enjoy the environment up there. Um, let's show the last couple birds. I think, what are the last two that we have? The Eevee? Or is that the... That's the Amakihi. Amakihi. Yeah, so there are, Amakihi are uh, pretty little birds and they're they're doing pretty well, actually. They're very adaptable, uh, and we do have them up along the uh, mountain ridge as well. And then the Eevee is the red bird with the long beak, and that is very rare. I haven't seen this one, but there have been sightings up there. That's so the similar to the Apapani. I always yeah. confuse them. Yeah, so the Apapani has white underpants. That's how okay. you remember it. Okay, and, and, okay. Um, so does the public, how will they gain access to it? Is there a contact information that you might have? For yes, well, we have a number of working relationships with schools or other entities that, that have been coming up on a regular basis. Um, but probably the best way right now is through Camp Timberline. Uh, we've started to talk about this, but Camp Timberline has been up uh, along the mountains uh, at about 1,600 foot elevation. Um, for about 50 years or so. Um, the facility was first uh, built by the old phone company. It was like a telephone communication center. Uh, and then it became a, a company retreat for the phone company. And then it became a, a church camp. And recently, Kama'aina Kids, uh, a local provider of child care services, um, they've been managing it for about 20 years, and um, they've decided to move on, and they have too many other things to do, and they're having a hard time making a go of it. So now um, Gil Evelands uh, is uh, trying to keep Camp Timberline open and focus on environmental and conservation and cultural education. So uh, it's been a youth camp for the past 50 years, and it will continue to be a youth camp, but we want to bring more focus to bringing all people up to do conservation work and learn about the environment. So it's, a, it's an interesting trend, and one of the things that I'm hoping to do is bring as many people involved in sustainable and environmental and Hawaiian cultural preservation mm -hmm. as possible mm -hmm. onto the show, because we know that those three are part of the fabric of sustaining a community and a mm -hmm. community's quality of life, particularly hanging on to our culture and our natural resources. Um, so, what kind of partnerships are you doing with other organizations that are out there that are trying to bring education outside the classroom yes. to the natural environment? Well, everyone we can possibly partner with, we're trying to. Uh, the Malama Learning Center uh, has done a lot of work along the Waianae Coast, and then in Kapolei, they have a lot of relationships with uh, high schools, they do uh, service learning and after school programs. Uh, we're hoping to make uh, Camp Timberline a focus for their activities so mm -hmm. they can come up. Uh, we're still working out the details on that, but uh, uh, another example would be uh, the Waianae Mountain Watershed Partnership. So the landowners of the Waianae range, including the state and the federal government uh, and Gil Evelands and, and the Ed Olson Trust, uh, we're part of this partnership uh, that receives grants for doing conservation work. Uh, and the partnership needed a place to have a base yard. They were actually in the wrong mountains. They were over in Ko'olau. 
And so we found a place on our property where they can come. It's their base of operations. They can land helicopters. They can bring in fence materials and, and things like that uh, to facilitate the conservation work that they're doing. So we have that partnership going. Uh, with uh, UH West Oahu, uh, just over this past weekend, I was up there with about 30 students. They come up to do some place-based learning. Uh, they visit a cultural site. They get a lecture from our, our cultural practitioner. Uh, learn about the history of the site. Uh, the landscape is just filled with uh, the remnants of the Hawaiian population that lived up there. Very unusual. Uh, and that's another thing that we're doing is trying to bring um, archaeological resources to bear to, to learn about and to protect the archaeological and cultural resources that are there. We have stone mounds and enclosures and burials and house sites and any number of things up at elevation. Actually, we have a photo of mm. one of the archaeological sites. So yeah, that's a picture of what we call the paw. It's about 110 feet square, a stone enclosure. It's historically, in historic times, it's been used as a cattle pen. We know that it's been modified. But we also have a carbon date that goes back to the late 1500s or early 1600s from uh, carbon that we found underneath one of so the setting stones. So pre-contact. So definitely a pre-contact site. Uh, in fact, a, a paper uh, uh, about this archaeological work has just recently been published. Um, so uh, that's, uh, and that's in the blue shirt there is Pat Kirch, who's a renowned Pacific archaeologist and Polynesian right. and Pacific archaeologist. Is it his paper that's been uh, published? He, we... he is uh, one of the authors of it, yes. So if we looked his name up, we'd find it? Sure. Okay. And, uh, but that, this is a, a site where we invite school groups to come up uh, to consider the cultural landscape. Uh, but nearby, what we still have work to do is to clear out some of the stone uh, platforms, some very impressive walls and things that are, that are in the nearby gulches. And uh, we hope that will be a center of uh, learning uh, and relearning the cultural aspects of the mountain. They probably, uh, this, this area probably um, was able to support thousands of, of native people and the remnants of their lives there are still uh, on the land. So actually, <clears throat> within the Ahupua'a land structure, the folks who were living at this elevation would have been doing what exactly? Mm. Well, it's a, that's a mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been very little archaeological work done up in the mountains. When you think about uh, most of the uh, native Hawaiian occupation in the islands and the way they lived is in the valley bottoms with the taro fields and the heiau and either uh, you know, luakini or agricultural heiaus are basically along the coastline. That's where most people live. But here up at elevation at about 1,600 feet, we have remarkable selection of um, these kinds of cultural sites and, and rock monuments. Um, they were probably growing sweet potato at, mm -hmm. at elevation to sustain themselves. There must have been a water source which has subsequently dried up with the denuding of the forest and the replenishment of a non-native forest. But there's evidence of springs. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, just 100 yards from where this photo was taken, there was an old ranch well. So even in historic times, there was water uh, up there used to support cattle. Uh, so uh, there's a lot to be learned about what happened, uh, how people lived. Um, that uh, stone alignment in that paw, that enclosure, actually, uh, it points to the rising of the Pleiades, Makali'i. And that, when Makali'i came up uh, in uh, ancient times, that was the marker for the beginning of the Makahiki season. So one theory is that that large enclosure could have been a place where the men of the surrounding community all came at the beginning of the Makahiki season. They would witness the rising of the Pleiades and the word would go out saying, okay, the, the festival season has begun. If you have a disagreement with somebody, you got to put it off. This is a time of no warfare, a time of uh, festivities and, and celebration, a uh, celebration of life. So we may be looking at, in that particular enclosure, a real indication of a critical element of the Hawaiian culture being practiced. And that's exciting to consider, and not just to study about how it used to be, but in order to restore those practices and bring people back up 
in modern times to understand that and practice that again. That's astounding. And obviously, we have a lot more to learn from Gary Gill when we come back from our break. This is Sustainable Hawaii, and we'll get more information about the makahiki, the cultural advantages of, of preserving that archaeological remnant. Thank you. We'll be right back. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cindy Matsuki, and I host High Growth with HTDC, where we talk about all things tech, innovation, entrepreneurship, and manufacturing, because there are tons of things that are happening in Hawaii in those fields, and we like to share them with you because people, more people should know about them. The show broadcasts live every other Tuesday at 3 o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii, and tune in, and we'll see you then. Thank you. Aloha. This is Reg Baker, and I am the host of Business in Hawaii. We talk about positive stories, positive stories of businesses in Hawaii, how they have been successful, and how they have overcome some of the obstacles that a lot of us encounter when we try to have a business here. And believe it or not, there are a number of positive stories here, and we want to talk to all of you. So we broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock, uh, and it rebroadcasts again on Olelo Channel 54. So I sure hope to see you next time. Please tune in on Thursdays at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We're back with Gary Gill, and the Gill Eva Land development is what we're talking about. It's been Actually, the non-development. The non-development. <laughs> the preservation. The sustainable <laughs> development of a 7,000-acre property that the Gills and the Olsons and the public, Trust for Public Land came together and have preserved for posterity for you and me, for, the, for all of us. And we just left off talking about some of the cultural impacts because mm -hmm. there are tremendous archaeological sites there. And one of the things I'm wondering is what are the partnerships that you have with Native Hawaiians mm -hmm. and do you have, uh, who's stewarding the archaeological sites? Well, it's a good point and it's a difficult thing to do. Um, we're lucky in that uh, on site with a lot of history and knowledge uh, on the mountain when we um, helped to purchase and preserve it was a, a gentleman who is now the mountain ranger uh, and he's the kahu of the environmental site uh, and the, the cultural sites up there. Um, his name is Thomas Anuheli'i and he's a Nanakuli boy, uh, but he's up there and uh, doing much of the management, everything from like when a tree falls down, you gotta open up the road to uh, working with the fire department when there's a fire, uh, but he's also a cultural practitioner. So um, he uh, performs the Hawaiian protocols when groups come uh, to visit the sites uh, and has been coordinating a lot of the work for uh, anything from student groups to Hawaiian cultural groups who come up and uh, tend to the site and, and help to preserve it. We're also, I, I should put a, a shout out uh, to Shad Kane and his group. Uh, before we came onto the mountain, uh, Shad's group of young Hawaiians was tending the site, keeping the, the grass down and uh, providing uh, access to it under the authority of one of the Campbell uh, descendants. Uh, so Shad did a, a, and his group did a lot of work uh, there to uh, first provide some malama to that, that area that we call the PAW. And uh, he's gone off and doing more good work out in EVA on, on the plains. Um, but uh, we owe him a debt of gratitude for really um, seeing the significance of that site and bringing people to help preserve it. Um, but that's just one of many sites that are, that are up there. And uh, as we uh, have others been explored yet, or you just have Well, the, the, in terms of um, exploration o over the years, I mean, we know where they are. They've been, there's been archaeological surveys done. Uh, in fact, w I went out uh, maybe five years ago um, to help ground proof, to, to identify where some of these sites have been plotted on a, on a GIS map, and we found a whole other a set of burials and cultural mm -hmm. sites that had not been plotted. Just, I mean, because everywhere you look, you know, there's no. there, there are things up there. So it's it's a big task. Uh, do you to do you think them. that indicates that there's so many more archaeological sites everywhere that we're not aware of? You know, it's it's a good question. Um, this 
this may be unique in, in the islands. I'm probably not the expert to ask that, uh, you know, there are uh, people far more knowledgeable than I am about uh, the remnants of, um, you know, Hawaiian living and cultural sites uh, in the mountain areas. But as I said earlier, most of what we know about is down in the lowlands. Right. So it's unusual and it's, it may be unique in Hawaii uh, or on Oahu uh, that we find uh, so many uh, cultural sites and archaeological sites in the mountains at, at elevation. And I think it's just a part because, um, you know, for example, if you, if you look at the names of the mountains, the Hawaiian names of the different peaks, well, you know, you have you know, Mauna Kapu. That's right. that's pretty significant, right? You know, it, it, this is a, a place mm, which taboo, is uh, you know, restricted, right? Or, or sacred, or however you'd like to translate it. So, uh, and that's, that's just, you know, uh, up from where all these dwellings were. And the seat of Hawaiian royalty, of the Hawaiian, the Oahu Ali'i, was in a district called Lihue, which what we might now call Kunia. But it was right there, just downhill from where we are. And from the site that uh, the landscape uh, that we now own and are trying to protect, um, you can see at sunrise on a clear day, you can see all the way to the Big Island. And you can see all the way to Kauai. I got pictures of this. You can, mm -hmm. you know, not every day, but on a, on a good clear day after a rain. This is probably the only place in the Hawaiian chain that you can see all the other islands from. So it has a lot of significance, and that might indicate why we're finding so many archaeological and cultural sites there. And maybe it's also the elevation and the particular nooks and crannies that allow you to be able to see so many of the other endangered species. Mm. One of them, I know, is the happy-faced spider, mm -hmm. which I was elated to be able to see on a hike up there. And we have a picture of it. Not many people have seen this. Tell so, us the size of this. So yeah, the, the first thing you need to know is this thing is tiny. <laughs> so when you look at the pictures, you think, wow, look at that thing. It looks like a tarantula. Uh, you know, that would fit on your pinky, pinky nail, on your pinky on finger, mine, right? On mine, smaller know? than yours. Yeah, um, uh, right. So it, it takes a little look in, uh, up there along the summit ridge. Uh, again, these are some of the resources that uh, remain in that little zone of native plants along the summit ridge up in what is the nature preserve above our property. And there's also the Hawaiian tree snail. Now the, the kahuli, the, the tree kahuli. snails are uh, really, this is a sad story. Uh, and they're also very tiny. They're, well, they're about the size of, of your thumb knuckle, usually, that, um, when they're fully grown. But uh, they're really crashing. The, the population of tree snails is, is in a desperate state right now, uh, partly because it's been so dry and hot and the climate is changing, also because of the infestation of cannibal snails, uh, Jackson chameleons, Rats these are all invasive mice. species. They're all getting up higher and higher into the forest, and they're munching on these snails. These snails used to cover the whole island, from the Ko'olaus to the Waianais, through the central plains. You'd turn over, 150 years ago, you'd turn over a plant, and you'd look at the bottom, and it would be covered with these snails. We had a population on Mauna Kapu of uh, what was fewer than 100 of these snails, and they don't travel far. You might find them on just two or three trees in a little area, and that's, that's all that's left of them. We had to move that population. We could only find 27 snails left. Wow. And uh, we had to move them uh, with the state and the, the army uh, conservation workers and put them into uh, an enclosure to protect them. So a little bit further up the mountain on state land, there's a, a few acres that are enclosed by this special fence and it and keeps the rats out, and it keeps the, sna the cannibal snails out, and it keeps right. the chameleons out. Uh, so some people call it a snail jail, but I, I say it's a gated community for snails. <laughs> so Let's see a picture of that do, fence. Do we have a, uh, yeah. I think you might have a picture of, uh, see, there that's not a snail fence. That's okay. a pig fence. Okay. Okay, uh, we don't have so, snail No, fence. a rat will go right through that. But uh, we did have to move those snails. I'll talk about that one in just a second. But the, the snails had to be moved off of Mauna Kapu and put into this special enclosure oh. so that they can, um, can survive. Um, and it's, it was a sad day because 
in, in one way, you're happy that, okay, we saved these snails, but we had to move them from someplace they had been living for millions of years, mm -hmm. and now they're not there anymore. And they may not survive because of that adaptation? Uh, just the weather's been so hot and dry, and we're seeing Jackson chameleons getting up mm -hmm. into the mountains, and, right. uh, you know, pigs bring in, you know, uh, they disturb uh, the story. But having, story and having moved rats. them, they may not survive because of the new... Well, hopefully they're going to survive. There's a, the, the Army has built a, a handful of these different enclosures along the Waianais, and there's some in the Ko'olaus as well. So, you, you know, you look and you, you might be hiking in the forest and you come across this steel fence, right. you know, with electro, electric wires along the top, and it's curved in a certain way to keep the snails out. And that's, that's the way to keep the species alive. And, and uh, who knew that our Army is out there protecting the environment, particularly Small snails the and happy only face ones spiders. Left. They, they, they got but the money to do it, unfortunately. They have so, the money, but yeah. it's also indicative of the United States Army as well as the Department of Defense's acknowledgement that, that our uh, environmental, our natural resource sustainability mm -hmm. is an absolute uh, uh, priority mm -hmm. for national security yes. because as we're experiencing the depletion of natural resources around the world is where we're experiencing the occurrence of conflict. Mm -hmm. And so That's while we may put up a, a fuss about our taxpayer dollars going towards the preservation of species and watersheds, we have to understand that's really part of the defense of our country and our quality of life and our ability to get along in the world so that we're sustaining these natural resources. That's a good point. I and that fence, a, you're going to tell us about oh, how so you're sustaining fence. resources with that fence. <laughs> okay, so this is a, that's me, uh, this is a, a, a fence that we're constructing with uh, volunteer support, uh, and that's a, that's a pig fence, and we're enclosing about five acres of uh, wet forest in the Akupu area, about halfway up the mountain. It's about 2,300 square uh, feet high in elevation. Uh, inside this fence, uh, we have some sandalwood, we have koa, some ohia, some uh, papalake pao, uh, uh, some nice native ferns. But what happens is the pigs just come up and they just bulldoze the place, right? They're just so ravenous. Um, and they, they work their way up e from either side of the mountain and they'll just plow through the ferns and then they create these mud puddles and that brings the mosquitoes breeding and that's going to hurt the birds. And inside this fence also we have a number of those um, pairs of alepayo. Mm -hmm. So we want, what we want to do is, uh, we're about halfway done with that fence right now, we'll be working on it in another couple weeks. Um, that will keep the pigs out of this five acres and then within that fence, once we get the pigs out, it'll be easier to manage the rats uh, and we can restore the forest, take out the exotic guava and the silky oak and the Christmas berry and the weedy plants and bring back in natives. So in, a, in just a few years, in my lifetime, I'm going to see that be a 100% native forest. Well, that is a fabulous vision. <clears throat> One of the things I'd like to ask you to do for us, Gary, today is talk to our viewers about how they can support your vision, the work that you're doing with mm. the Olson Trust and with the Trust for Public Land and everyone who's been involved in conserving the 7,000 acres. Um, how can the wider community get involved and support you in this effort mm -hmm. and also participate in getting their hands dirty and mm. getting out there in nature? Well, that's exactly what we're hoping to do. Uh, I can just say, personally, a story I often tell is uh, you know, I grew up in the woods. Uh, I, I grew up in Round Top uh, behind the, the city, and we used to always go hiking and camping. It's just how we, how we grew up. I remember in my 10th birthday in fifth grade, I invited a bunch of friends to come, let's go for a hike. And all their parents freaked out. It's like, what are you going to do? It's dangerous out in the woods. I said, ah, come on, it's my backyard. My mom talked them into it. And so me and a handful of friends, just by ourselves, no adults, we went out for a hike, someplace I you know, grew up hiking. I knew where I was going. It was no danger. Um, but flash forward, you know, 25, 30 years later, in my 20th reunion of high school, one of my friends who came on that hike, she saw me, I hadn't seen her since graduation. She said, Gary, remember that hike we took on your 10th birthday? These things stick with people. 
the experience, especially so many of us living in an urban environment now, we think our food comes from Costco. You know, we, we think, you know, that, that uh, you know, the cool breeze comes from air conditioning or something. Um, we've so far been removed from the, the natural environment, uh, from just, you know, the birds and the sky and, and the things that are so intrinsically so important. So now we have a we have a venue now we have we have a mountain so you're to participate. So you inviting folks to come, come on up down, and okay. participate. So what we want sure you to thing. do is is to make a difference not only in the environment, make a difference in your own life. This yes. these are life changing experiences, just like my friend who came hiking and when we were ten years old and well, remembers it to this day. Gary, your family and you now and your partners are clearly changing all of our lives by maintaining a very important natural resource. And I want to thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. It's an and honor to have the opportunity to do it. And we look forward to hearing an update. All right. I'll be Mahalo. back. Thank you.